Hello everyone, I am Triti Dhere and welcome to lecture 3 of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973. In today's lecture, we'll be continuing with the criminal uh, trial setup. In the last class, I had, as I had started off, that when you're seeing a criminal trial, there are a few important players there, in the courts, the councils, the police, the prison, prison and correctional services, etc. In the last class, we dealt with the courts part. We saw the hierarchy, we saw their powers, what are the different kinds of judges that you see, what are the different kinds of magistrates, who is holding what power, who can sentence, how much. In today's class, we'll complete that entire section. We'll see the legal counsels, we'll see the police, and then we'll see the prison and the correctional services in respect of the code of criminal procedure. Also, when we are dealing with the police, we will also see the distinction between a cognizable offense and a non-cognizable offense. So let's start with today's topic. So the first topic of today is a legal counsel. So if you remember, when we were starting off with the courts, I said obviously now when you read the courts, you understood there is a presiding officer. So there needs to be somebody who presents the case from either of the sides. So there needs to be counsels. So in the code, you'll see there are three types of counsel actually in a criminal trial. The first counsel, let's take a wild guess. Obviously, one will come from the accused side. Accused side is there. Second, you need somebody to press the prosecution's case, the victim's case, the sector case. So there must be one lawyer. Here you need to understand that as we had already studied, as you all know, that a crime is a wrong against the society and not only an individual. So the society needs representation. The society's interest, uh, interest also needs representation. So the state participates in a criminal trial in, by, the, uh, by the means of a PP. Who is a PP? A public prosecutor. Now, a public prosecutor is a person who appears for the state, he pleads for the state before any court in any case which is entrusted to it. This is section 301 and the PP also has a power that it can withdraw any case but it will take the consent of the court. So now what we are seeing here is that you saw the second time that the state is participating. So just because the state is participating does it mean that the victim, if I, if somebody in my family was subject to uh, some kind of an assault, then does it mean that my that I as a family member of that person or that person himself cannot uh, represent himself in the case? It does not mean that. The victim also has a chance. You can also have a victim can also engage a particular counsel to assist the prosecution. The main prosecution will be carried out by the state. The victim's counsel will also assist them. So under the criminal trial, you'll see three types of counsel, state, victim, and the accused. Now you understood what is the need of a PP. Now you understand what is the role of a PP. Now, now you, you are seeing that a PP is doing what? It is pressing for the prosecution, but his role is not just to secure conviction. PP actually has a very indifferent, impa uh, impartial, impartial, and a very neutral position. PP's role is just that whatever evidence, whatever materials have come on record, whatever is there, he has to just ensure that all of them are put before the court. A PP is only duty is to aid the court to reach the truth. PP should not be so overzealous that he will go and press for a conviction when there should not be a conviction or he shouldn't try to protect someone when there should actually be a conviction. So PP is actually standing in the middle trying to balance things everywhere, trying to see that no injustice is being done. Please understand the role of a PP. Though he is representing the prosecution, but he is not there to ensure that a conviction is done. His duty is to ensure that justice is done. So let's now move and see into what are the provisions under the code. Now first you will obviously first see if PP has been defined anywhere. You will see under section 2U. We have already done in the first class what is dealt under 2U. That was a reference to section 24 person appointed under section 24 and all of that. So let's see what is there in section 24. So for every high court, either the state or the central government, what they'll do, they'll consult with the high court, they'll appoint one PP and one or more additional AP. Uh, APP additional public prosecutors what they will do they'll conduct in a court any prosecution appeal or any other proceeding on the state or the center's behalf and center can also appoint certain councils or uh, like certain public prosecutors for conducting a case in any district area now this was for the high court not what for the uh, district courts then the state there is appointing a APP an APP for every district and these persons can be appointed for more than one district. And how are they appointed? 
the dm of a district and the sessions judge of a district they sit together decide on a particular list they draw up a list of persons who are fit to be appointed in a district and uh, there will be no appointments made of persons whose name is not there in the list however if there is already a prosecuting officer's cadre in that particular state then you will appoint only from that cadre you will deviate from the cadre only when there is no suitable person and this deviation also will go where you have to go back to the dm's list that he had drawn up and person should be taken up from that place only then what do you see what do you need to become a public prosecutor you need to have 7 years of practice now sometimes you know that time and again there are some special cases or special class of cases identified for those cases a special pp who has 10 years of experience can be appointed and as i was saying before that just because there is a pp in a case does not mean that the victim has no right to engage any advocate to assist him a victim can also engage an advocate of choice to assist the prosecution now this was about pps and the additional pps let's see section 25 which is talking about the assistant public prosecutors i hope with the last class you would able to appreciate the difference between the word additional and assistant so here when you see the word assistant public prosecutors remember these are those public prosecutors appointed by the state for a particular district for whose court the magistrates sit here the center also can make such appointments now in general you are seeing who can be a pp an assistant pp obviously no police officer is eligible to be a pp assistant pp but if no person is available then any person the dm can appoint as a pp provided he has some requisite qualifications but in some situations a police officer can also be made as a, 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 a assistant pp when when only first thing that he should not have taken a part in the investigation and he should not have been below the rank of an inspector then let's see section 25a section 25a is talking about the directorate of prosecution now the directorate of prosecution is made by the state government here it consists of director of prosecution and deputy directors of prosecution and for becoming a deputy director or a director you should at least have 10 years of practice as a advocate and how are they, is are they appointed they are appointed in conference with the opinion of the chief justice of that particular high court and so who heads the directorate of prosecution it is headed by the director of prosecution and who does he function under he functions under the administrative control of the home department of that particular state so if it is uh, the state of bihar then the director of prosecution will function under the home department of the state of bihar then what we see that all these deputy directors the pp the app the assistant pps all of them are subordinate to the director and to the deputy director who are subordinate the pp the app and the assistant pp and what are their powers and functions they will be specified by the state government by notification however these particular things whatever you are seeing that who is subordinate to whom etc when the advocate general is appearing as a pp or he is performing the function of a pp then these particular provisions would not arise because he is having a different sort of position so this was when you are seeing in respect of the prosecution we saw the victim and the public prosecutor situation now let's see the third what council that we were uh, we had read that is the defense council this has been dealt under section 303 so a person who has been accused of an offense or some proceedings have been instituted against him obviously has a right to be defended by a plea of his choice this is important because if there is no representation from his side there would not be a fair trial a fair trial is important why obviously for the natural justice etc and article 22 one of the constitution is also given him that right and also 303 is given him right so now what can be a situation for the prosecution the state is taking up the burden they are pushing it but sometimes the accused who's been made an accused does not have the means to hire it or he is indigent he is poor etc so to ensure that fair trial is not hampered there is a provision of legal aid under the code that is section 304 where the state will take the expense and a pleader will be assigned to the accused person where it is seen that he will not be able to engage a pleader because he does not have sufficient means and then the legal services authorities are also playing a very important role in this behalf and legal services authorities act 1987 also provides legal aid to the needy 
Now this was another organ that we did. We finished courts, finished with legal counsels. Let's see what what are we do, what has been dealt in relation to the police authorities. Under this head, we'll also be seeing the difference between a cognizable and a non-cognizable case. So you, as already stated so many times, crime is a wrong against the society. So for prevention and protection of protection from crime, what are we seeing? Every state government is maintaining its own police force. Now, what are the provisions related to police force which has been defined? You will see section 2S, police station, and section 2O, that is officer in charge of a police station. You can go back to the definitions and refer to it. Then here, section 36 is also there, where you are seeing the powers of a superior officer. So, superior to officer in charge of a police station has the same power as that in the local area where he is appointed as that of a police officer in, has in the limits of his own police station. So here what we are seeing, in general you will see in respect of police officers, not much what is a hierarchy structure, all of that has not been dealt under the court. There are separate police acts, states will have their own rules and regulations etc. where their regulations have been done, their rules and regulations have been laid down. Here for this purpose of CRPC, you will only see that they have defined a police station, an officer in charge of police station and they have ensured that what would be the powers of a superior police officer. So in code of criminal procedure, you are seeing that what are the powers in respect of investigating them, what are the powers in respect of arrest, etc. All of that you will not see who is appoint, who appoints the police officer, all those provisions are kept in separate acts. And 36 here also you are seeing that mostly the definition is revolving around the officer in charge of a police station, whatever powers he has, the superior officer in respect of an offence will have the same powers in the area that is. The area will obviously extend uh, officer in charge of police station's uh, power is only limited to his, to his uh, police station but the DGP obviously will have over the entire state. So that is there. So now let's see with respect of the court what else is there in respect of police authorities. So, so under the court you will see which we will be dealing on in later there are two modes for invoking the criminal process. One is by a means of a complaint. You should, what is the complaint? Please go and reply, uh, remember what we had dealt in the definition sections and other by giving it to the police. Now as we already know crimes are an act of sense of society and the burden to ensure that justice is being done is on the state so state maintains its own special force for this investigation purposes etc. Now just because there is a police force does not mean that the CRPC requires that for every kind of offense the police force needs to be used. So there are two types of divisions have been made is a cognizable offense and a non-cognizable so you can go back and see the definitions that was under 2C and 2L. Now we will go into detail what this distinction is. If you can remember COG and non-COG offences, the main distinction was whether there is a power to arrest without a warrant or not. So a cognizable offence, they can arrest without a warrant because the responsibility of the state is to, uh, there to bring the offender to justice. In a non-COG case, they cannot arrest without a warrant. Officer has no power or duty to investigate without the authority of a judicial matter. And mostly the non-cognizable cases are quite like private wrongs. However, the moment the judicial magistrate has given his permission that go forward with the investigation, the police officer gets all the powers except the power to arrest without warrant. Now let's see some differences so that you can understand what, what is the exact, uh, what is actually why this halabu is all about the cognizable and a non-cognizable case. First, very basic distinction between the them is they have been distinct uh, made different on the basis of the seriousness. Uh, the moment you hear that's a cognizable case, you can understand that by nature it is quite a serious offence. Non-cog is a lesser serious offence. Cognizable case can be taken more as a crime against a society like murder, etc. And while a non-cog is more in the nature of private wrongs to people, some sort of a private wrong that they can address privately also. In a cognizable case, it is required that the police interference is desirable, that without police, they cannot be done. However, in non-cog case, generally we see that a police investigation interference is not desirable, that is why it has been made a non-cog, like marriage offences, etc. have been made non-cognizable offence. In a broad proposition, if you want to try and maintain the distinction, if you are seeing a, a crime with a punishment more than three years, most of, more often than not, it is a cognizable case, while in a non-cog, mostly you will see less than three years punishment. 
and obviously arrest without warrant and arrest here is only with warrant however this three years provision now you'll ask why how did we arrive on this three years proposition now this was this is in accordance to the first schedule where if you when you open the first schedule you'll see that in the end there's sort of a blanket uh, operation that has been written uh, that if it is more than three years it will take one for offense etc this has been done what because the code of criminal procedure is is cannot the schedule cannot write all the offenses that are written in so many of the acts so just because it cannot list all those offenses under all the laws they've just put down this three-year proposition however mostly now the trend is that that any kind of a serious offense is made cognizable irrespective of the fact whether its punishment is greater than three years or lesser than three years like stalking is extra cognizable offenses now this was about police uh, police force let's see a little more about section 37 40 39 here we, what, what i'm trying to show you is that section 37 is talking about these are related to the public and other officials sector section 37 is saying that if a magistrate or a police is demanding reasonably demanding your aid that please help me in either taking this arresting this person or preventing an escape of a person this person is authorized to the police or the magistrate are authorized to arrest and he's asking your help you are bound to arrest uh, uh, help that particular police or magistrate or if he is asking your help in case of preventing or suppressing breach of, breach of peace or preventing injury uh, attempted to be committed to any railway canal telegraph etc in these situations the public has to assist the magistrate and the police this is however not a general bar just because he is there is a magistrate or a police and just asking you to come and help does not mean uh, it does not mean you need to help like you're bound to help only if these are these situations and only if it is a reasonable demand then only they can take your assistance and if you are not doing so if you are intentionally omitting to provide them aid then it can you can also be punished under section 187 ipc now then we see sections 40 and 39 40 is duty of officers who are employed in connection with the affairs of a village that they have to make a certain report it's a long section you can go to the barrack and see what are the various offenses that have been listed what are the, the uh, what is the duty of such officers who have been uh, actually employed in connection with the affairs of the village will make a certain report to the nearest magistrate or the officer in charge of the police station like uh, for example if there's somebody he knows that a particular receiver of vendor of stolen property stays in this particular village or he has made his residence there or there's some unnatural or sudden death that is it is his duty he was appointed to inform the authorities about the affairs of the village and it is his duty that he has to go and inform this is in respect of an officer section 39 puts a duty on the public that they have to give information of certain offenses where he if he is no he is knowing that it has been committed or if he is knowing that somebody has an intention to commit any of it and in absence of any reasonable proof a burden will be on him to prove the excuse that why he did not give such information to the nearest magistrate or the police station and section 39 is not only limited to acts committed within india it is also including those acts which are committed outside india but would have constituted an offense if committed in india so here when you're seeing sections 39 40 37 etc you see the criminal procedure code is also putting a duty upon the public also though 39 is not given much emphasis either with the police or the public or the courts even but it is still there the, in theory it is still there that as a public i also as a responsible citizen should do my duty that if i come to know of some information i should inform to the magistrate or to the police station so that at least that crime can be prevented and other such things so this is how beautifully the code has been written and you can see that not only the onus is on the police but also on the officers who are employed in connection to it or and also on the public though in reality we see these revisions are not given much now let's move on to the last part of today that is the prison authorities and the correctional services so obviously if a sentence has been passed all the the police has investigated the matter goes to court the councils have argued the court has given its decision that okay this person needs to be convicted or even if it is an under trial prisoner somewhere somebody has to keep them in prison so prison authorities are the one who execute the same unless that person has been dealt under probational laws uh, what are probation laws etc what is 
uh, various provisions dealt with section 360, 361 and the provision of Appenders Act, that we'll deal on with later. But for now, the prison authorities and the correctional services are ones which are executing the sentences or they are keeping the under trial prisoners. And CRPC has no specific provisions that under this provision, we are having these prisons to be constituted. They have their own separate acts. So with this, we come to a conclusion where we, a conclusion of this this lecture also where we finished off with the leftover portions of the important players in a criminal trial. I hope this lecture was clear and lucid. From the next lecture, we'll move on to the more important and the more, uh, uh, more basic concepts of a criminal procedure that would be there like arrest, summons, all of that. So I hope I was able to do justice with this lecture. See you in next class. Thank you and bye.